Let me start with uh, a bit of a numeric picture of delegated institutional capital. So if we think about the institutional total worldwide assets is 64 trillion in 2012, which is a large number. And if you, I, I can't move. If you compare that to the retail mutual funds, for example, which are 27 trillion, we know a lot about retail mutual funds. We don't know as much about the institutional uh, capital, um, the performance and, and profiling how these investments are made. Institutions delegated the vast majority of that money, 48 trillion. And we can further, that, by the way, that is 29% of worldwide investable assets. So, so it's, a, it's a large ch chunk of the market. If we break down that 48 trillion, we see a small part of it goes to the institutional mutual funds. And the vast majority it goes more directly to, to asset managers in investment vehicles that, holds, that are small numbers of clients, either solo or small numbers of clients. And the asset managers combine the, the allocations, the strategy level allocations, into what we're going to call asset manager funds. And they do this for reporting reasons, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. Now, there's very little money. There's, there's very little research, despite the, the huge size of, the, of this market. Um, and that partially has to do with the 1940 Investment Company Act, which doesn't regulate this market like it does the, the retail side. So there's a lot of prior work on, on asset managers, and this doesn't do fairness to the, the literature. There's a smaller literature on asset managers specifically, and, and John Noellen, for example, who was here, has a nice work um, on, on this sector. But basically, the, the study of asset managers themselves has been hindered by a lack of data, which we were able to get access to, to better data than this had, than at least what we think, better data than it's been had before um, to study this sector. And what we, what we were able to get access is to a consultant database. So the consultants, um, the consultants assist the pension funds and other institutions in doing their delegated a asset management into strategies, right? So, the, so going all in one hall, document that it's a vast majority, it's like 80% or something in this large, that goes through consultants when they're delegating. In order to facilitate this, the asset managers think the Black Rocks. The Black Rocks then report their performance at a strategy level. Strategy level, think something like Asia value or Australian equities or, or some sort of fixed income special um, strategies. That they report, they aggregate up the information, all the investment vehicles from different pension funds and, and endowments and so forth, and they pull them together and use a fund level structure that they provide data to the consultants and the consultants then put this in a database that they use to advise their pension fund endowment clients and the like. Okay? So we were able to get one of these databases with quarterly assets under management, client counts, fee structures, and monthly performance. It's large. It's 22,000 asset manager funds representing over 3,000 asset manager firms and 25 trillion in 2012. That's, that, that's a large number. Okay? Now, of course, we care about the quality of these data, and I'm not going to have much time in my 20 minutes here to go through the, the, the different tests that we do and understanding the quality. Let me just highlight a few things. The, uh, the, the consultant, one of the, the important features of the consultant is audits on the asset managers and on their funds. Um, also the managers, which we're, we're just learning more from our discussant, the managers are, uh, take very seriously the, the Gibbs compliance of reporting the accurate returns and profiles. Um, in the database, we have the creation date, and we also have dead products where, where there's no, there's no lo the assets go down to one. So incubation and survivorship biases are not a problem for us, we believe. We do an, a few tests following Blake Lehman and Timmerman um, or in terms of the representativeness of the data and the se selection, and we're going to show some robustness, and I'm going to skip that in the, in the interest of time. But what we find, and just highlighting one point, is on selection that we don't see that the firms that re report more of their assets under management perform worse, which would be consistent with, with selection like we see in the hedge fund literature. Okay, so, so let me show you, let me first profile the, the consultant database. Okay, this, these are in billions of dollars, the units here. So you see at the bottom, the bottom row of 2012, there's 27, um, 
27 trillion in the consultant's database, representing about 60% of the, what pensions and investments <coughs> says is, is the institutional um, delegated uh, assets. And then we have the backfill data, which we can, we can parse out. Importantly, our consultant database covers 83% of asset management fund, funds, firms, sorry, firms. And the ones we, we looked up the ones that we are missing, they tend to be smaller insurance or smaller banks and, and then some firms and asset managers in Southern Europe where, where the consultant is not covering these data um, either because they're retail clients or because of the re reporting requirements. Okay. So if the first thing, let's profile what an asset manager fund looks like. Let's focus on the, the medians rather than the means. We also have the institutional mutual funds in here, so the skew is enormous. So if we look at the mean, the, the mean asset manager fund has 285 million in it, representing six clients. So the, those are mandates of about 50 million per client. Okay, it's very different than obviously a mutual fund. We're using the word fund as an aggregation of a small number of clients here. All right, um, and there's more fixed income in our database than there is than there is equities. Um, turn the second thing, turning to fees. Now, obviously, the, there's an interest in the literature since the work of Philippon and Greenwood and Sharfstein about the cost of financial intermediation, and we can do some back of the envelope uh, calculations here. Uh, the Greenwood and Star Sharfstein estimates suggest that. Securities intermediation itself accounts for 726 billion in fees per year, or, or cost value added, in, in in terms of securities intermediation. If we do a breakdown using the percentages from French um, and also from Barber and Odin uh, at all, we can see that retail mutual funds account for 87 billion of that, more or less. 300 about a, is individual trading, but there's no information on, no aggregation on the institutional asset management side. We provide an estimate of, of that. We have fund level data on fees. So for each of our 22,000, we know the fee structure, where the fee structure is not just one number, it scales with the size of the asset under management. And if we use the, these data, we come to 170, 72 billion per, per year in fees pay to institutional asset management. That's a large number. Okay, um, let's look at what that means on a uh, basis point per, assets, uh, per asset under management and see if this passes the SNF test, if you will. Our average valuated asset, uh, average valuated fee per asset is 47 basis points. And as, you, as one would expect and one would hope, public equities are cost more than fixed income and then asset blends and hedge funds um, in particular, hedge funds cost more and asset blends are a mixture of, of um, fixed income and public equities. The next thing, having looked at the profile and at the fees, and we want to then start to look at returns. Okay, the first, the first look we, we do at returns is the aggregate returns just subtracting out the, the broad asset class benchmark. So we use six asset class benchmarks that are shown there and we just are subtracting out the asset class returns here to calculate a gross alpha. We find, somewhat surprisingly, uh, that the, al the, the alpha, both in gross and net, is positive, 119 basis points uh, gross and 72 net, um, which means that the average dollar earns 119 basis points above the market. Okay, notice we're not saying anything about risk here. It's just to, just to subtract out the market calculation. But the, we do this calculation for two reasons. First of all, we want to draw attention to the, to the tracking error. Okay, note that these tracking errors are also large um, in line with the active retail mutual fund tracking error, which means, remember, that the, the delegated institutional asset management is twice as large as the retail mutual fund sector. So the literature on, on active management misses two-thirds of the market. Right? So it's, it's suggestive for, for future understanding what active means and, and the whole literature on active management. The second reason we, we look at the aggregate gro gross alpha is a simple adding up constraint. The idea here is that if asset managers achieve a gross alpha of 119 basis point, that's 29% of the market. Just doing a little math here, that implies that everyone else's returns are 49 basis points lower 
than, than the, the market, right? It's just adding up before fees. If you put that in dollar terms, that's $432 billion per year that everyone else. <coughs> Suggesting the incidence of returns is very important. And thinking further about the incidence of returns, if we d divide that 432, 172, as we said before, goes to the asset managers and 260 to the institutions. These are some large numbers. OK. Finally, we get to the, the being able to take the returns and think about performance. We, we didn't say anything about risk or performance in, the, in those calculations of gross alpha, but now we want to. So we take a very specific institutional perspective here. Um, and institutions, the, 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 way, the way we like to think about it, and after dwelling on this and for a long time, is institutions t typically have a two-step process where they run a portfolio choice model to determine the strategy allocations, taking into account the returns and the covariances and such. And then, if they're going to externally manage those, those strategy allocations, then they choose among asset manager funds. What this means is the performance assessment for a institutional, for an institution is that they are interested in the net alpha calculation and the tracking error, right? So these mandates go with it, uh, bring with them the, the incentive to maximize the net alpha relative to a strategy level benchmark because they are doing these allocations on a strategy level, right? And so this is how we're going to measure performance is we're going to look at net alpha relative to strategy level benchmarks and we're going to look at tracking errors. Okay, so now we are benchmarking each fund um, in one of 235 strategies and that many benchmarks. And we, we are, and we're just aggregating these up to the broad asset classes, but they're, they're specific to, two, there's, there's a lot more, more benchmarks than, than there are asset classes here. Um, and what we find is that across, across the different asset classes, what we, in aggregate, a 96% gross alpha relative to strategy benchmarking in a, in a, in a one-factor model. And notice that the beta here is 0.88, and it's, 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 not, um, it's, it's lower than one relative to the strategy benchmark. Okay? And we also see a positive net return of 49 basis points, significant. And the tracking errors are in line with, with the research and also are still active. Um, large, but, but much smaller than what we saw before. When we, the first thing we wanted to do when, after we ran that is to understand what is the source of that, of that, of the performance. And so now if we look, just look at the bottom row here, and starting on the right-hand side, we see that, or starting in the middle, the asset class benchmark returns a sharp ratio of 0.18 that represents a return of 3.95. If we look at the strategies that the asset managers are doing, the strategies they're picking within the asset classes have a higher return and higher standard deviation, okay? So, so but a higher sharp ratio in general. But even above, above that, the asset managers themselves, with the same standard deviations as the strategy benchmarkers, are, are exhibiting a higher return, which means that they are generating alpha even within that strategy. And it, it's not that they are taking on more risk, is they're taking on the same similar risk, but as we saw before, the 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 beta was less than one, so they're taking on different risks than the than the strategy. Okay, we do a number of robustness things along these lines um, to to think about our sample selection possibilities, which we don't find evidence of sample selection driving this. And then of course we're very much concerned about benchmarking and making sure that our results are not about gerrymandering. Um, and we, we talk more about that in the paper, but in the interest of time, I'm going to go to what, what we next do is thinking, think about what explains this performance. And to, when we were started to think about this, if you look at what asset managers say they're doing, they say things like smart beta, tactical factors, this, this sort of language. As we thought about it, this language really is representing, is equivalent to the Sharp 1992 model. The Sharp 1992 model takes factors, tradable factors, and it, for each fund, and, this, and we, we implement this, the, for each fund, um, they load the fund returns on the factors. And constraining the, the weights on those factor loadings to be equal to one. Okay? Then it recovers um, 
a, a mimicking portfolio, that, a style portfolio that, that, that loads on these factors. And then out of sample, we can compare fund returns to those of the style portfolio. Okay? So this is just implementing Sharp 92. And when, when we do, you see the weights, like take, the, for example, the second column there, the weights in the U.S. equities load on the U.S. equity, the type of factors you would think that they would load on, right? These are the weights that sum up to 100 at the bottom. In terms of performance then, using those weights, this is, this, these estimates are comparing the fund level returns to that of the style portfolio. And what, what we find here is that the style portfolios explain how asset managers achieve the positive net alpha. In other words, there is the return here. The alpha is basically zero. The gross alpha is basically zero. And so above that which you could have achieved with a smart, a smart beta portfolio implementing sharp, there, there, is no, there is no excess alpha. OK? So it suggests that the, within the strategies, the asset managers are taking factor exposure to outperform the strategy benchmarks. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm going to skip that. This then suggests that the next, the next thought would be, well, if that's all the asset managers are doing, could institutions have done this themselves? If they had known the factors, if they had known how to implement this, this sort of por portfolio that just loads on the factors, um, could they, with the, with the asset class weights that they, they actually ex expose themselves to, could they have done just as well by just doing their own factor exposures? So what could they have done as a self-constructed portfolio? Well, they could have used institutional mutual funds. Okay, more recently, ETFs, and we'll talk about that. But in, within the period, they could have used institutional mutual funds. So what we do is we collect the, those data and the asset class weights from the consultant data, and we construct mean variance optimal portfolios, in particular, long-only portfolios, and such that the, the pensions or other endowments might have done themselves. And then we can compare performance. And in particular, what we're interested in is, is an indifference cost. So what cost would make institutions indifferent between delegating and managing in-house using institutional mutual funds with, with the factor exposure? Right? So that is the exercise we do here. And uh, do I have a pointer? Let me focus on, on these numbers here. So this is the asset manager data. Then we we have the, the replicating portfolio where they, they do a mean variance analysis with either short sale constraints or diagonal covariance vectors. And the indifference cost here is somewhere between 43 and 73 basis points. So let's interpret that. That means that if the institutions could have implemented this fact, if they first of all had known to do this factor portfolio, and secondly, if they could have implemented it with a cost somewhere no higher than somewhere between 43 and, seven, 43 and 73 basis points, they would, they would have done just as well as had they gone to asset managers. If, they, if the cost is higher than that, then they would have been better off with asset managers. So then in panel B, what we show here is the actual cost of the institutional mutual funds in the period. right? And so these are weighted to the actual weights that we use in the data. And if we look at the median, the cost is 86. If we look at the quartile one, the cost is 65 basis points, which is about the same as somewhere between 43 and 73. So let me interpret that. This analysis suggests to us that, that during this period, the institutions could have done just as well, but not better. That then using if then using asset managers if they had implemented their own factor exposure if they had known how to implement their own factor exposure and then implemented these portfolios, okay? Or another way to say it is asset managers just earned their keep for 172 billion in fees per year during the the implement, but they did earn their keep. Okay, that is what our this analysis said. However, and in, in my last minute here. ETFs are cheaper now, right? E ETFs offer an alternative to the institutional mutual funds where the price structure is much lower. And so at this, this suggests then, going to my conclusion slide, that ETFs are eroding the comparative advantage of asset managers. Okay, so let me sum up with our, our main bullets here. 
The delegated institutional assets represent 29% of investable assets. It's enormous. Institutions pay $172 billion in fees annually. The delegated institutions prom or, or the delegated capital is, is prominently actively managed, and the literature on active management should think about that. Um, in aggregate, gross alpha overperforms the market by 119 basis points, which means everyone else's returns are 49 basis points below the market. From an institutional point of view, asset managers outperform strategy benchmarks by 96 basis points, and their sharp analysis show that that's due to factor loading. Um, if we take that lesson from the, the sharp analysis and implement it in a portfolio that the, asset, that the institutions could have done themselves, it suggests that, they're large, that during the period they were largely indifferent, and so the asset managers earned their keep at 172 billion. 172 billion. However, now the low-cost liquid ETFs are likely to erode that comparative advantage.